Good morning, ADDC. Good morning. Well, let's just, just set a quick this setup up. for the slides. How is everyone doing today? You look really, really great. Let me tell you that. <laughs> oh, there we go. In just a second. I mean, you understand this. This is technology. You all get this. There we go. Perfect. Wow, everyone, we're super thrilled to be here. Thank you so much for the organizers for, for having us here. It's so nice to be among so many great and talented people like yourselves for the next, next few days. And we're super humbled to be the ones to actually open up the conference. And um, we're no pressure. We're going to be fine. Everything is going to be good, hopefully. And uh, today we want to talk to you about innovation and how we approach problem solving as a design agency. We're going to share with you mistakes that we've done. We're going to talk about solutions that we found that work. We're going to show you examples of how we do design sprints and how the outcome of a design sprint looks like. But before we jump right into that, let's get acquainted really, really quick. My name is Raz. I've been a designer for the last seven years, and I started off like most designers did. I pirated Photoshop right at the beginning. Then I got into graphic design, did web and UX, and finally landed on product design and strategy, which I've made my profession right now. Most of my career was working remote with companies from all over the world as a consultant, helping them figure things out a little bit better and helping them innovate better and faster. Hello, everyone. My name is Anna. I'm a product strategist, and I've been working with digital products for the past seven years. I worked in various setups for, from startups to company, corporates, um, outsourcing agencies, you name it. And I've seen a lot of processes, both on the product front and on the design front. And I've seen a lot of things that work and a lot of things that didn't work. And today, we want to share some of the magic and some of the experience that we have when it comes to innovating and also when it comes to bringing products to life. We joined forces a couple of years ago. We created a product consultancy called Just Mad. And we work with companies, uh, with a huge variety of companies, no matter where they are, how big or how small, we help them innovate faster by using a set of tools that we found to be very efficient. Now, every single person in this room is in the business of bringing ideas to life. Whether you're a product manager, designer, developer, project manager, doesn't really matter. Our job is to take an idea, and in a spe specific stage of that life cycle, we have an input, and we bring something to the table. And throughout our experience, a lot of people would approach us and say, hey, I have this amazing idea, or I want to build this next huge thing, or I just have a problem, and I just need to solve it. But what we've seen throughout this process is that every single project that we would start would look something like this. At the beginning, when it comes to understanding what you need to build, doing research, doing all of that, that initial stuff is really cluttered. There's a lot of guesswork. There are a lot of unknowns. But as time passes, you kind of figure things out, and you come up with a concept. And when it comes to implementing, things get really, really easy. Now, we try to figure out, and looking back through our experience, trying to understand what are the pathways that a company or a team would take to take an idea and actually launch it. And we've identified four patterns that uh, basically stand in the way of innovation. And we're going to go through them one by one. The first pattern that we notice is that you have an idea or you thought about a solution, and then you start building it very confident. You put a lot of money, a lot of resources in it, and then eventually, very proudly, you're launching it. Just a second, my slider. And now you're thinking, OK, now that we launch it, let's ask marketing to sell it, because why not? Obviously, this is a bad idea because you don't bring enough value to your customers. You should be first asking them what they need and what they want and then invest with confidence. The second pattern that we notice is that you have an idea, but you sidetrack a lot. There's clearly a misalignment in a team or stakeholders are not sure what the business goals are. And eventually, you end up in a situation when you do not launch. This will be a flop because there's no clear vision, obviously. And again, another pattern that we notice is that you start with an idea and you start building it. You want to make it perfect. And you're just piling feature after feature. Perhaps you start seeing something that your competitors are doing and you want to add that to your product. And eventually, you will end up in a flop because the product will never get to see the light or it will never get into the hands of your users because it takes too long. And the last one that we notice is that you have a lot of great ideas and you have multiple solutions that you can solve, you can bring to the market, but you try to do them all at once. Obviously, this is not a good idea because you cannot put all your resources and all your energy and time into a lot of places. Eventually, this will end into a flop because, again, 
there's a huge lack of focus. So after working with so many teams, we realized that there's a huge uh, reckless spending and no focus on what needs to be done. There's no early validation because people start to fall in love with the solution, rather they're falling in love with the problem that they need to solve and they're very confident and they think that they are the user and they know everything. There's a lot of reckless spending and there's no focus and you start building and building and you, you're not sure what, where it has to go. You make unconfident decisions, you just make assumptions, and you're making sure that you're trying to do the best thing that you can, but obviously you're not asking the people that are gonna use your product. And the last one, and the one that we've seen it so many times, is that you focus a lot on the output and not on the outcome. So instead of focusing on the value that you're providing for your user, you're focusing on the features that you have, and piling feature after feature because it looks good on the roadmap. Well, we think that our job is to solve problems, and we, heard a lot of people evangelizing the idea of focusing on the user needs, and we totally agree with that. But as problem solvers, we think that you also think about the business goals. And you have to find an efficient and effective way to bridge these two. So you have to focus only also about the user needs, but you need to focus about the business outcomes that you're going to get as well. And you have to do it in a smart and in an efficient way because we don't have too much time to waste. Mm -hmm. So after seeing so many cases of flops and unsuccessful products that never reached the market, we asked ourselves, how can we get from idea to a quick validation and then start building it confidently and then launch it? And what we want to share with you today is how we approach the, the process of taking an idea and validating a solution really quickly. And when I say quickly, I mean four days quickly. We know it sounds crazy, and we've trialed and error a lot trying to find a recipe that works. And the way we make this function is by using design sprints. They are super popular right now. They started off at Google, and everyone is picking them up. Companies are became, becoming more aware of the value that the design sprint has. And just to give you an overview, let's look at the definition of the design sprint. The design sprint is a four-day process that allows you to solve big challenges, create new products, and improve existing ones in just four days. And it can literally compress weeks or even months of work in a very short amount of time. We know that sounds really crazy. We couldn't believe it ourselves when we actually read the book and tried to understand how this works. But we've tried it, we've bulletproofed it, and it really, really works and really yields some really great results. And just to sum it up, you can solve big challenges, you can create new products or validate ideas quickly, and improve new exist existing products in just four days. And let me just walk you through the process of how the design sprint is engineered. Everything starts with the challenge. You, have, you either have an idea or you have a challenge that you need to focus on. You have to get the right people around the challenge, key people that have an impact and that can actually drive success for that challenge and idea. You get those people in a room for a few days, and you generate a mass of potential solutions, right? Everyone has their input. Marketing has one input, development has one input, design and product can have a different input. And you generate these, the, this amount, insane amount of solutions, and you just pick one. It's like placing a bet. You have to start somewhere. You place a bet, you take that idea, you build a prototype really quickly, and validate it with real people by testing. And this is all done in four days. And the sprint anatomy looks something like this, so you can understand why it works that way. The first day is all about alignment and exploring the problem space together. So on the first day, on Monday, you will gather everyone together, and then you'll start mapping out the experience of your product or your service. Then you're going to select one key moment that you want to focus on for the entire sprint. And after that, everyone will start generating solutions. So everyone will generate a sketch. On the next day, on Tuesday, it's all about placing one bet. So the team will vote on one solution that was generated on Monday, and then you're going to put in all the details. You're going to create a storyboard for that solution. On Wednesday, you're going to create a prototype, which can be paper or digital, no matter what it is. It should be representing the solution that you already voted on. And on Thursday, you're going to test it out in the real world with real people. So you're going to do five user tests, and you're going to find out if you validated or invalidated your idea. Now, you may take a look at the sprint anatomy, and you may think, OK, this doesn't look that complicated. There must be a catch behind it. Well, we guarantee you that there's no catch behind it. It's actually super efficient and super simple to apply. You can try it out. It completely changed the way we work and the way we, thar we started to think about innovation. And speaking about the way we used to work, this is like a typical workday for most product teams. So in between the moment you step in the office and the moment that you leave, 
you have a lot of meetings, a lot of distractions, and the moment that you actually do the work that matters, it's quite short. So it's somewhere in between those. Whereas in the sprint day, we have a totally different structure. Everything is time boxed. You have a clear set of rules that you need to follow. Every single activity has a set of instructions. And you will be surprised the outcomes that you will have only after one day of sprint. We're not going to lie to you. The sprint is intense. It's an intense experience for everyone involved. But it, it concentrates that amount of work that is spread out through a week and just gives everyone in the same mindset. And this is the book that actually changed the game for us. This is the original spring book written by Jay Knapp in 2016 when he was at Google Ventures trying to figure out how to innovate slightly faster. And we're working with the updated four-day version, as you noticed. The original book is the five-day one. We recommend you try both because it might fit your schedule and your team structure better, one or the other. So both of them are work equally well. The only difference is that the four-day version is slightly more compact and a little more intense. But that's not a problem. We really recommend you read this book. It's really, really going to help you out. Like, even if you don't try design sprints, it's going to give you a different alternative and a view over how you should approach coming up with ideas and validate them. Now, let's look at exactly how the sprint works. What are the inner principles that make the design sprint work so well? The first core principle about the sprint is that getting started is more important than being 100% right. Remember the example that we had where you actually never get ch the chance to launch your product to the market? The sprint is all about gathering momentum, moving fast. It's about placing a bet. Stop second guessing. So you will see that at the end of the sprint, you will actually have one validated prototype. The second really important principle is that having tangible results is way more valuable than endless discussion. I'm pretty sure everyone here has had the scenario where they would go into a meeting, and at the end of the meeting, the only outcome was another meeting. And that's what the sprint is, is meant to be against. Work on tangible uh, things. Look at something, whether it's a sketch, an idea that's drawn on a board, or a prototype. Everything is tangible in the sprint. There's no talking on top of each other. And this is especially critical, because we want to avoid this chit chat that is not bringing any real results. The next one is learning in the real world is much more important than desk research. Obviously, we are very good friends with research because we are product designers both. But we do not want to spend months and months and months on end to do research. We want to validate it super fast. So you will see that at the end of the four days, you will actually have a conversation with real people about your idea or about your solution. One interesting principle is that in the design sprint, you don't have to rely on visual design skills. Although it's called a design sprint, Everyone from the product team can contribute. You don't need to be this incredible artist. You don't need to draw pretty rectangles and circles and, and characters. You just need to have ideas. And the way the sprint is designed is flexes your creative muscle and allows you to come up with great ideas without needing for you to be an incredible artist. And the next one might sound a bit sad, but it isn't. It's actually super efficient together but alone. So in the sprint, the team will gather around, and they will work together at the same time on the same problem, in the same room, but they will work individually. So there are no distractions, no unnecessary conversations, no unnecessary meetings, just pure work on what needs to be done. Now, let's take a look at how the sprint compares with other methodologies that we have out there. The first one is design thinking. And I'm pretty sure that most of you are aware of the design thinking framework. So it's a methodology or a philosophy, if you may, a way of thinking about solving problems. But the problem with design thinking is that sometimes it can change into design overthinking. And why do we say that? There's a lot of flexibility in the process. So there's a lot of way you can empathize with the user. You can define the problem. You can ideate. And when you're, you're just starting off with the product or with the project, you need something structured. You need a list. You need a checklist. You need to make sure that you have a step-by-step -step guide on how to do things. The next one is Agile. This is a way of working, a set of guidelines for how team works. I'm pretty sure that all of you are familiar with the a Dev Sprint. Actually, Jake Knapp, when he wrote the book and he called it a design sprint, he wanted to make it more similar to the Dev Sprint and make it similar to the Devs and make it sound like fast and also quite catchy. They're, they have some similar concepts, but they're not exactly the same thing. And then we have the design sprint. This is a recipe, a clear process of solving problems. Yeah, the way we like to think about it, like imagine design thinking. This is really common. We see people think design sprints are here to re replace design thinking. That is just not true. 
design sprints are basically overlaid on top of design thinking principles. And uh, a really nice comparison we like to use, imagine design thinking is a general cooking class, and the design sprint is a clear recipe of making paella, for example. Now, we've seen this phenomenon quite a lot. People think that now that they have a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And there are certain scenarios where the design sprint makes sense. Right? Uh, for example, if you want to change something really small on the web page, you might not need a design sprint. And the way we evaluate whether a challenge or idea is worthy of a design sprint, we use the simple three-step rule. First one, is the challenge at hand high stake? Is the business going to suffer if this goes wrong, if this project is, is a failure? Will this hurt the business in a significant way? That means it's a high-stake problem. The second rule is, are there multiple people involved? Usually in the sprint, we need more than three people from uh, different departments because we need to align everyone around this challenge and get everyone's input on, on the solution. So for example, if you want to change the color of a checkout button on an e-commerce website, you probably don't need a design sprint because two designers could do that in like a couple of hours, maybe one hour. And the third rule is, is this an urgent thing? Do we need to solve it immediately? Is the business bleeding money because of this? For example, you might have a high sign-up rate, but people leave your uh, product after, I don't know, one usage. Then that's, that's critical. You need to look at that because you're losing people by the minute. And we, we identified four scenarios, four categories in which uh, uh, sceneries place themselves when it comes to running a design sprint. You want to run a design sprint when you want to validate an idea really, really quickly, right? Whether it's a new product or an idea you want to test out, it helps you move really fast. The second scenario is when you want to grow an existing product, where you're looking at metrics like engagement, retention, activation. You want to increase and push, push those metrics up. The design sprint can help you generate ideas really quickly to fix those problems. The third really important scenario is when you want to get buy-in for an initiative. You want to propose something to your managers or to your team, but they say, ah, we don't really have the budget right now, we don't really have the time. So what you might want to do is take the design sprint, test your assumption in the real world, and go back with the results and say, look, I tested this out really quickly with five real people. How about we talk about it now? And then the last scenario is where you want to get alignment inside a team. We see this so, so often. People are misaligned around what they need to, to solve. Everyone knows there is a problem, but they just don't understand it properly. So whenever you want to get your team aligned, you can use the designs for just for that. Now, who can benefit from the design sprint? We get this question quite a lot. We're going to start with the obvious. Freelance, UX, and product designers. Whether you're a single consultant that wants to uh, up your game, you can use the design sprint as a competitive advantage. And we've done this so many times, and we've seen a lot of people upgrade their career by using design sprints. Whether you're part of a team as a product, project manager, or scrum master, this can help you accelerate the process and kind of get a, get a super power role in your team, like a product hero. Early stage startups can benefit from this immensely because we're talking about companies that don't have a lot of budget. They cannot afford to do months on end of research and just fail, right? Because that's not really a great option. So early stage startups can really benefit from this. Then we have enterprise companies that are looking to innovate. Whether you're talking about digital transformations or future proofing using technology, Design Sprint can help those companies quickly go through different types of ideas and validate them quickly. And as I mentioned before, consultants and agencies can use this and actually sell the Design Sprint like we do to all of your customers. Now, let's take a look at who needs to be in a sprint. Let's talk about the sprint team. Ideally, we recommend to have in between four to seven people. Anything below can become very subjective. Anything above can become quite messy. Now, we're very careful, and we quite try very often to handpick these people. It's super important to understand the value that they're going to bring in the sprint. Looking at the roles that we have, the first one is the facilitator. This is the person who will orchestrate the sprint. This is the person who makes sure that each exercise is done correctly, everything is on time, and everything runs smoothly. The next role that we have is the decider. This is the person who, in the real world, actually has authority over the product, and also is the person who calls the shot. And depending on the type of or the size of the company that you're working with, it can be the CEO for a startup, or if you're working in a corporate and where it would be a bit difficult to get the CEO in the same room for a couple of days, it might be the product manager or the chief product officer or an important stakeholder. And then we have various members depending on the industry, vertical, or the type of product or service that you're working on. It could be tech, sales, customer support, it could be marketing, it could be communication, design, you name it. Usually, it should be someone who has actually a valuable input on the product or the service that you're trying to build. And before jumping into the example that we prepared for you, we just want to leave you with a 
couple of ideas that we identified about the design sprint. So it completely changed the way we used to work and it drives us to make more informed decisions instead of just guessing and making assumptions. The next one is, and I'm pretty sure that you found this quite often, there, uh, there's a lot of misalignment in teams. There's a, a lot of misalignment in teams that work in the same space together. Imagine what we can find in teams that are distributed. So you will get a lot of clarity and focus if you just apply one sprint. You start to focus on the outcome and you're not focusing on the output anymore that much. So it's not about the number of features that you're piling up, it's about the value that you're gonna bring to your customer at the end. And the last one, you're gonna do some confident building and you're not gonna spend money, time, and resources with no use in building something that people do not want or they do not need. Now, we know this was quite a lot. We went through a lot of things, a lot of concepts. And we think the best way for you to understand how the design sprint is valuable is we can actually look at an example. And we're gonna do just that. Some of you may know who this guy is. His name is Chris Heria. He's a, quite a huge fitness influencer when it comes to calisthenics. And he approached us and said that he wants to build a fitness app where people get customized training programs based on their needs, right? So he approached us, he said like, I need this quickly. And this was obviously the perfect, perfect opportunity for us. Remember the three rules? First of all, it was a high impact problem. He needed that for his business because that was his competitive advantage. Yeah. Second of all, there were multiple people involved. We had uh, content, the CEO, marketing, design, development. We have multiple people involved that need to bring their input. And the third one, it was critical in terms of time. He needed urgent attention because he was losing users because he didn't have uh, this component and didn't have something to differentiate himself. So we started with this challenge, and as I mentioned, we got the right people around it. We had the designer, which was myself, the product manager, which was Anna, an engineer, the CEO, and someone from marketing. We got these people around this challenge, tried to understand it, and we generated a mass of potential solutions. We started brainstorming. Every single person in the team came up with a concept. And the concept is basically a sketch on paper, and it looks something like this. This is actually the one that I've done. And I'm a designer, so as I mentioned, you don't need to focus on visual design skill. I just put my phone on a piece of paper, drew the outline, and started drawing boxes. And this flow is meant to be uh, the idea of, of a customized workout builder. This is how it looked like. And this was something that was done in 45 minutes. And every single person in the sprint team did this, this exact same thing. But this one got the most votes, and it actually went into prototyping. And just, this is by the end of the second day. So in two days, we understood the challenge, we understood the needs, and we generated solutions. And we created uh, this sketch and then a storyboard. And this is the actual prototype that we tested out with. This was built in one single day by two designers, myself and one more person in our team. And I'm gonna play this, this is an Envision prototype, and this is what we actually tested with five real people the following day. And we validated that this solution was really, really good for what, uh, what Chris wanted. So you would choose the workout generator, you would tell it what uh, type of workout do you want. You wanna go with calisthenics, then go next, and then it would tell you the workout style. I wanna do fat burning, you would go next. One muscle groups, let's go for abs and chest. Go next. Then we're gonna have the length. Do we want a uh, warm up or not? And then we're gonna choose the difficulty level. And this is just a few seconds, and after this, the app would generate you a fully custom workout just for you, which you can customize, add, retract exercises, change the number of reps, and you can just adjust to it. And basically, after that, you would save it. So this is just one day of work to create this prototype, which we actually tested. And right now, if you go to the App Store and search for Heria Pro, you're gonna find this exact same flow implemented. This would traditionally maybe take more time than just four days to ideate, sketch, prototype, and test. And this is what the, the benefit of the design sprint is. Fast validation and confident building afterwards. We didn't have any second guessing when the developers started working on this. They knew exactly what they needed to build, and they knew exactly this is gonna work because we validated it really, really fast. So this was our recipe. This is how we actually take an idea, validate it really quickly, and then build with confidence. And just to, to sum up the benefits, the sprint helps you ideate and validate an idea really quickly. It helps you confirm a good direction before investing and putting in time, energy, resources, money. It helps teams get aligned around business goals and working towards the same thing. And it allows you to rely on data and not assumptions and guesswork. These are just a few companies that use the design sprint. Just from a quick search, Google obviously, where it was born. 
Lego, Airbnb, Uber, Intercom, there are just a few companies that figured out that the design sprint is needed in this ecosystem, where, co where all co companies are super competitive, they need to move fast, they need to innovate better, they need to validate their decisions really, really quickly. And just before we finish, we want to leave you again with the Sprint Anatomy. So on Monday, it's all about alignment and exploring the problem space together with the team. You will map out the experience, focus on one key moment, and then you're going to start producing a mass of solutions. On Tuesday, it's all about placing one bet. So you will select one solution, which will get into a storyboard. On Wednesday, you will create a prototype. It can be paper or digital. And on Thursday, you're going to test it out with five real people in the real world. And you can do this process as many times you think it's necessary, as long as you have something tangible at the end. My phone stopped. <laughs> right at the end. Okay, mine too. Oh, no. Thank you so much. <laughs>Uh, so if you haven't gone to addconf.com uh, slash QA, go there now, and you can submit a question. Uh, I've got a few questions for you yes. uh, here. Uh, so one of the, the ones that asked that I think is really interesting is um, when you have a, a larger organization, which yeah. you mentioned, it can be difficult to get people from the right teams yeah. uh, to even just get that time. How do you go about working in a large organization to get that space to do what you need to do? Okay, should I take this one? Yeah, okay. I can take it. Uh, I think that here we have two important points to mention. The first one, so we work a lot with big companies and first of all, it's super important for us to explain the value of the process and sometimes we don't even call it a design sprint, we call it an innovation workshop because people are not familiar with the framework yet. And the way we identify the people that needs to be in a sprint, we draw a matrix influence and interest, and we try to map out that matrix with the people that we have in the team. We have a preparation week before we actually start a sprint, so we never just go there in a, to a company and we start a sprint right away. We need to understand a bit the problem that they're trying to solve. And then we identify the key members and the key stakeholders that are involved in that project. Yeah, and we really, really try to explain and try to ask them, okay, how would you approach this problem that you're having? Because most of the time, companies approach us and they say, hey, I have this idea or I have this challenge I want to solve. We tell them, how would you traditionally do it? Well, we would do a brainstorming session. We've got a few people here and there. We're just going to spread out across a few weeks. And then we ask them, like, what if I told you you could actually compress everything into one week and validate your idea really quickly? And they're like, how do you do that? And we give them a similar presentation to what you've seen and try to explain all of those things. And they get really interested. And we try to... Uh, spread the design sprint like a virus. We try to talk to as many people and get them excited because in, from a team, like if six people are really, really excited about it and want to try it out, they're going to ad hocly convince everyone to join. And we know it's hard to get stakeholders in the room because they're really busy all the time and it might, might get really complicated. But if we plan in advance, they can actually reserve a few hours in the first two days to join the design sprint and help out. It's all about managing expectations. I think that's the best answer to, to bring it. Great. Another question that got a lot of upvotes was asking about four days instead of five. Uh, so if peop some people look like they're familiar already with the format. Uh, what made you decide to go to four days, and is there anything that you cut to mm -hmm. make that happen? Okay, so we found it to be way easier to sell it. So instead of five days, we actually spend only four days with the company, out of which two are workshop days. So Wednesday, the prototyping part and the testing, it's on us. So they only need to spend two days. This kind of couples with the first question, how we managed to sell exactly. it. And we did so because we managed to uh, com compress the first two days, but we do a lot of preparation before. Yeah. That's how we managed to make it four days and not five. Yeah, this, is, this is something that we found work for us. So the first sprint that we did was completely unprepared. We just went into the sprint and followed the, book, the recipe in the book. And we noticed that we need a little bit of preparation, especially as consultants. We jump from one industry to another, and we need to get up to speed really quickly. And we need to understand exactly what we're up against. So we do this kind of like preparatory week that takes a few of the pressure of the ex actual sprint week in our hands, and we do that. And that way, we can actually do the four-day four compressed version. Great. Uh, an another couple questions about the validation step. So uh, in day two, if that doesn't work, uh, what do you do? And also how you decide that it is working or not? How do you measure that success of that prototype? Mm -hmm. So for day two, if we figure out that the solutions are not 
are not okay, like if, if the solutions are not good. The thing is that everyone is involved. Like Anna mentioned, one of the principles is that we work together but alone, and everyone has to come up with one concept. And all the, like the, the series of exercises that happen in the sprint are meant to take you from the problem space and slowly transition you to the solution space. And you're basically gonna have all the tools and the knowledge to come up with a concept. We've had this scenario where people would come in with preconceived ideas, and that's fine. Because what would happen in a traditional work process? That person would push their idea forward no matter what. But in the sprint, everything is kind of like democratized and everyone has some input. Everything is all about voting. Everyone uh, places their votes on what they think the best solution is. And even if, let's say, uh, a, a big stakeholder still wants to push their idea forward, that is fine. Because if it's going to be successful, everyone's happy. But if it's going to be a failure, you fail within four days, not a few weeks. Right? So even if, if we find that the solutions are not satisfactory, it's not really that big of a problem because we're still placing a bet and we can work and combine multiple solutions together to come up with a great uh, outcome. Maybe you can talk a little bit more about managing stakeholders. I think we've all been in a sprint where somebody really wanted to put their hand on the wheel uh, before they even started the sprint. They had an idea for how it was going to end. And especially when you're bringing people in from different parts of the businesses, how do you deal with that? We are very strict with the schedule and we have a preparatory call with everyone before and we explain them very clearly what's going to happen. And we also mentioned that if they interfere with the way of working and with the steps that we are going to follow, the outcome will be altered. So yeah. we try to show them a lot of successes that we had before, so we showed a lot of examples, but we also are very serious when it comes to explaining them that we have to do it this way to get that outcome. Yeah, like even as I mentioned before, if they come with their preconceived ideas and they already know what they want to build, we give them that chance. Because it might be good, it might be bad, but nonetheless, we're going to figure it out really, really quickly. Another theme that uh, people are asking about yeah. is um, getting that feedback um, in terms of like, how do you find users? How do you make sure they're good users? Yeah. Uh, and then decide what to do next based on that. Yeah, so there are two perspectives here. So when we work with B2C products, that's easier because we recruit them. We set up different surveys, we recruit them personally, we have a budget for that, we pay every tester, depends on the budget that the client has. Um, when it comes to B2B, uh, for example, if you have a medical software, that can be a bit tricky for us to get in touch with, I don't know, a doctor that we need to discuss. So we always leverage the client or the stakeholder. And kind of like use their network to find the right people for the testing sessions. We never really had problems with testing. So whether we, it was an in-person test, that was pretty easy to do because we would send out an, uh, an ad saying, hey, we're going to give you a $50 Amazon gift card if you join this user testing session. It takes 45 minutes. You're in. And we usually get like 120 applications for just five people. So it, it really works well with this idea of just yeah. posting it on LinkedIn, Reddit, Facebook, or like specialty groups. And uh, we also do a lot of online testing. We use usertesting.com, which is a great tool. We can just ad hocly put a prototype in place, give a few indications, and people just fill it out. And within I don't know, a few hours, we have four respondents already. More specific question about the solution after the four days, um, in terms of actually what that solution is and the, the actual interface. Um, someone is skeptical that they can do that in four days. So maybe you can talk a little bit about mm -hmm. how flexible that solution really is at the end of the sprint. Sure. So it's important to start with the core. Like if you're building a new app or trying to, to improve something that already exists, think about the core of that product or service. What, like if that thing would go away, the business would not make sense. And we always try to focus on that core component and build around it. And we usually couple up design sprints, like we would not build an entire product in a sprint. That is indeed impossible. But as you've seen in the example, we just focused on the builder. That app, actually we had four different design sprints because we focused on four different components. First sprint was the builder because that was the differentiating component. Then we had to do a design sprint for the analytics part and how the dashboard would look like and the metrics and kind of figuring out what muscle groups you're using the most and so on. And then we had a bunch of other design sprints to, to look at specific challenges in the Social context component. of the product. Yeah. So, yeah, it, it is impossible indeed to build a full product, right? Like even like if it's like a huge B2B thing with like a lot of dashboards and graphs and things like that, it is complicated to build in one day. Just focus on the core, get that validated, start building if you feel confident, and then in the meantime, you can run other design sprints to kind of uh, create the puzzle. 
And talking about at the end of the sprint, there are several questions around how do you sort of carry that momentum forward? What does your post-design sprint process look like? So at the end of the sprint, we prepare an executive summary that sums up everything that happened in the sprint and everything that we have in terms of feedback from the customers. And we have some recommendations. If we have a fully validated idea, so let's say 90% of the feedback is positive, we move forward with the project. If it is partially validated, then we have to identify where exactly is, what, where exactly is the problem. Is it something with the usability or is it something with the idea itself? Or if it's not validated, then we have an iteration sprint. And we go back to the board and we start thinking about the solution that we're trying to bring to the market. Um, so there's lots of more questions, but I'm just going to give you a couple more. Yeah, um, yeah. So one here is about um, how do you do a design sprint for things that are really hard to prototype, like VR or AR? And I would throw in something like voice as well to that. OK, so you can apply the sprint for services. We did that for our training. <laughs> uh, you can also apply the sprint for physical products. We never tried it, but we've seen a lot of examples. Um, we actually tried to apply the sprint for a sustainability project for a festival, which wanted to be zero waste. So we had to come up with multiple ideas on how to lead people to collect waste in a more structured way. Basically created fancy yeah. trash cans. <laughs> but um, yeah, very good point, very good question. Whoever put it, that's a really great one. Um, you tried to maybe... VR and AR, that is slightly complicated indeed. You might, might want to look at the sprint and potentially allow yourselves more prototyping days. Like if you feel that that core needs some really great prototyping, indeed, you might find yourself in a position where you might adjust the sprint a little bit and maybe allow two to three prototyping days if you think that is the scenario. And um, for the voice, uh, I've, I've seen a lot of examples that people do kind of like a Wizard of Oz thing where instead of having the, the actual have like a program that would talk back to you, have a person through a speaker, just trying to, trying to emulate the scenario. So in the book, there's a really nice example of a physical product of a robot that just talks to you and just brings you like a digital concierge. Like if you want a toothbrush at a hotel, you just call the reception, a tiny robot brings your toothbrush or your, your towel or whatever. So uh, there are a lot of examples out there, but uh, you can allow yourselves more prototyping days if you feel you really need more time to do that. But for digital, like something similar to what we showed you, like an app or an interface that needs to be mocked up really quickly, with like a two or three designers that are good with prototyping, you can actually do a pretty, pretty decent job and actually get your answers really quickly. And one more question here about um, existing products. So how do you come into something where people already have a strong expectation of how the thing works and, and sort of rebuild that idea? Mm -hmm. What does that look like? Well, usually people contact us because they have a problem, something doesn't work. So it's either a problem with acquisition, activation, retention, or engagement for existing products, or they need a refresh, whatever that means in their mind. Um, the idea of having already a solution in mind, it, it's not wrong. So the sprint is not about coming with exceptional new ideas, it's about just the process. So you can come with, a, with some ideas in the sprint and you can still think them through, but at the end you will see that there will be a voting session. So as Raz mentioned, there's a democratized session of voting and you will end up selecting the solution that is most probably the best solution to solve the challenge that you have at hand. Yeah. It's actually so much easier to do a design sprint for something that already exists because most of the times there are some types of metrics involved. Like, pe like the company knows why that's a problem. Like why isn't our, like that feature working as expected? Why aren't people using it? Because it's easier to see, maybe look at a heat map or uh, like visits on a certain page. And it's easier for us to kind of understand why we got there and what the main problem is. So understanding the challenge itself is so much more easier for existing products than it is for new ones. So uh, it's, it's, I would say it's, it's super easy to do that because redesigning is, is easier to do than designing from scratch, because you can actually look at data, understand what the problem is, do some prop, like proper design decisions, and then measure them again against the, the original version. And so. it's easier for testing as well, because you already have some customers, and you already know who to contact. And last question is, if there's any one anti-pattern that you've seen in all the sprints you've run, what was one really big thing for people to avoid? Don't start a sprint without preparation. Yeah. <laughs> That's the best advice that we can give you. Yeah. 
Yeah, I think that's that's the that's the Preparation best. Preparation is key. Like we we've we've heard about teams who said, I just read the book and I wanted to do a design sprint, and we asked them like, how did it go? Well, I decided to do design design sprints on Thursday, and we started on Monday, and uh, they said like it was a disaster because we didn't know the challenge and we didn't understand understand the challenge pretty well, and then that's where we figured that like, we did the same mistake. We would start a sprint just on the fly and assume it's going to work, but. Preparation is literally key. It's so important to do this thing we call problem framing before the sprint. It's, it's critical. It's going to help you get up to speed with the challenge if you're a consultant. And even if you're part of a team, it will help everyone get in the same mind space. And whenever you start the sprint on Monday, you're actually going to be so much more confident and you know exactly what you're going to tackle. And, and yeah, the, yeah, preparation is key. And we've seen a lot of people not doing preparation for sprints. And that's, that's a huge mistake from our perspective. That's also the moment when you manage expectations. Yeah. So it's super important. Exactly. OK, great. I couldn't think of a better topic to kick off this conference about collaboration than this. So thank you, Anna and Raz. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you.